welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Before we get into the word, guess what we're going to do? We're going to pray. I need to pray. You need to pray. I need God. You need God. Stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for your blessing us this day. We haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, short man, old man, young man, black man, brown man, white man. We haven't come to hear from anyone except the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us and heal us and strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us and guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you for all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ today. They're our brothers and our sisters and we're excited about them. Ask you to bless them as well as blessing us. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. As you take your seat, get your Bible, turn with me to 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. This is freedom for our future, part number five. Remember, there are three basic freedoms we're talking about. Freedom, and let me go through them real quick with you. Freedom, if you will, for the generations. It's not just for this generation. It's for the generations that will follow your children's 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 children. What you're doing today is setting a foundation for your children's children in the future, freedom for the generation. Secondly, freedom from financial institutions. We're sick and tired of paying $87,000 every month into a a mortgage payment and having most of it interest ridiculous. It's time for us to get free so that no one takes this building from us because of some crazy, has anybody ever seen crazy economy? Could anybody ever live in their life and understand the economy could get crazy? Hello, we all know it is crazy. And it could even get crazier in the future, but they can't do anything to us if we are free and clear and we own it and we're gonna own it. It's not gonna turn into a mosque like is taking place in Canada. It's going to turn into the service of the Lord for Jesus Christ to the generations. Third freedom, I love this. The third freedom is the freedom to do ministry. Can you imagine how much more ministry we could do with $87,000? How many people could we feed? How many homes could we build? How many things could we get going? How many people could we take care of? That's what this is all about. And so what's happened is there's a really a fourth freedom, and I love the fourth freedom the most. In fact, it's the freedom of your heart and the freedom of my heart, the freedom from any risk pressure that would come on our life. This last week I met with an elderly gentleman who was a, a keynote speaker at many places, and he was telling me that we could work things in order to pay this church off. He's had many years experience in doing so. And he started giving me all the things to do. And I looked at him and I said, those are all gimmicks. We're not in the business of selling gimmicks. We're not in the business of, you know, you bring money and we'll give you a blessing. It doesn't work that way at The Rock. This is about the heart. Can I tell you something? We could raise $50 million, and if we don't do it with a heart attached to it, it is no money at all. Or we could raise $500, but if a heart's attached to it, that's the most important. Are you hearing me? We're not selling out. Giving without a heart is no giving at all. And we're building the heart of each and every one of us in this place. This has got to be a real church of integrity, not a bunch a bull that sells indulgence and sells things to people and hypes the people to give. Anybody can be hyped to give. It's about giving from your heart that this is all about. Somebody ought to give me an amen. And as we look at the word of the Lord today, I'm taking you to 1 Kings 17 chapter, where once again we're going to look into the life of That's so bizarre of a widow. I don't know if you know this or not. Out of the five messages, three of them have been about widows. What's that all about? You stop and think about why does God in the Old Testament use a widow whose sons were being sold off into slavery? 
Remember, and then God said, go get those vessels and fill them with oil and paid for it and they got rich from that and they just did what was necessary. Then we see the old poor uh, widow that was in the New Testament and caught the heart and eyes of Jesus Christ and she brought her might in that caught a hold of him last week. And this week we're going to go to another widow. Why is God using widows to explain what it is that is something valuable inside of their character that God could use and create a miracle on their behalf? And if that's true, I want to know what it is, don't you? So that I can develop that character so that God can do something wonderful in my life. Let me tell you before I read the story to you what's taking place. There's a prophet of the land. His, land, his name is Elijah. Elijah has been an assignment from God. He's got to go to King Ahab. You don't know who King Ahab is, so let me tell you. He is a murdering slaughterer of the things of God and a murdering slaughterer of humanity. He'd have no problem in cutting you into pieces, all of you, and tonight have nothing but his wine and his grapes and his women. He was a filth dirt bag. And by the way, this King Ahab was not only a dirt bag himself, he was married to the world's biggest host. Her name was Jezebel. Ho is a word that we use in San Bernardino. You know what it means. And so here's this murdering tramp of a wife called Jezebel, and she's as bad if not worse than him. Are you following me? And man, these are horrible. And he has the assignment from God. Here's this prophet of God. Remember when I use the word prophet? The word prophet is an interesting word. He's carrying the word of God. An interesting way that the people got what God said. They didn't have a Bible on their lap like today. They didn't know what the word of God said. They had to wait for the prophet to come to town. He represented God. He spoke for God and God backed his words. Now God speaks to this prophet Elijah and says, go talk to King Ahab. Tell him that in his realm there will be no rain for years until you say there's going to be rain. In fact, it'll be so dry there won't even be dew in the morning hours. That's how dry it's going to be. And until you say, Elijah, that it's enough and there'll be rain, then it'll rain. So he goes and tells Ahab, Ahab can't stand him anyway because he's always speaking things contrary to what Ahab's life is about. You will find that people who speak and rub people the wrong way, oftentimes we ought to listen. Is he speaking from God that maybe he just rubs my personality? Ahab was rubbed wrong by this prophet, didn't like him anyway. He comes into the presence of Ahab and he says, King Ahab, this is the way it's going to be. Thus saith the Lord God, there will be no rain. No, there won't even be dew until I say there will be. And it'll be dry. You know what that meant? You may not know what that means. In his economy, that means everything dries up. That means you talk about recession, this is depression time. There are no crops. There's starvation in the land. Animals die. Crops die. Everything dies. This is not a good thing. It's a horrible thing. King Ahab is mad as a hornet. Then God speaks to the prophet Elijah, and he says, listen, go hide. I've prepared a place by the brook Hedron. And you sit there by the brook, the water will run through the brook, you drink from the water. And he says, not only drink from the water, but here's what I'm going to do. I will have the ravens, you know what ravens are? Crows. I will have the ravens bring you bread every morning and meat every morning, and I'll have the ravens bring you meat and bread every night night. You got to be kidding me. That's a miracle. Can you imagine being by the brook drinking the water? Here comes a bunch of birds. What are they dropping off? What in the heck am I going to eat that's been in a bird's mouth anyway? I mean, is it a filet mignon? Is it a, you know, Chateaubriand? What the heck is this? That's What kind of bread is it? It's got to be Jewish rye. These birds are bringing him this, and, and all of a sudden, the, if you will, the brook dries up. Do you know why the brook dries up? No rain in the land. 
The brook dries up. There's no water for him to drink. So God speaks to Elijah and says, I've prepared for you a widow in Zarephath that you would go there and she will provide for you. Now, when God spoke that to Elijah, he's going to go down there and find a widow. Don't you know that if he's going to meet up with a widow, he's thinking she's got to be wealthy. Wealthy because she's got to provide for herself, her family, her household, and also provide for me. So let's see, the tr let's see this adventure that Elijah is going to be on. And if you'll go with me to 1 Kings 17, chapter, start in verse number 9. I'll read to you. Arise and go to Zarephath, God speaking to him, which belongs to Sidon. Dwell there, seeing that I have commanded a widow. You ought to circle the word widow because, man, there's so much to learn from that word widow today. We're going to learn it and understand it, and we're going to see it. There to provide for you. Verse number 10. So he arose and he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow, circle the word widow, was there gathering sticks. Wait a minute. If she's rich, what is she doing gathering sticks? If she's rich, which he's obviously thinking she's going to be, she would have her servants gathering sticks. Now, you don't know what gathering sticks means, but let's talk about it just for a moment. You can go to any third world country today. Did you know the people go out every morning and every night and they gather sticks for the day? Why? So they can make a fire. Why? So they cook the food. So when they cook the food, they have the food to eat the food to get enough energy so they can go out the next day, gather more sticks to make the fire to eat the food. Are you following me? And gathering sticks is a very common thing in every country but this one. We have the EPA, the regulation says you can't make a fire anywhere. We'd all starve to death in this country because somebody, government agency, will give you a ticket if you start, well, you ought to go there. <laughs> so here she is gathering sticks. The very first thing he sees is something about her. She's obviously not rich. She's gathering sticks for a fire to make food. And he walks up to her and he says these words. She's, she's, watch this. She's, she's gathering sticks. And he calls to her and says, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Wait a minute. Now, have you ever stopped and thought about this? This guy hasn't said hi, hasn't introduced himself. How's your kids doing? How'd you, how'd you become a widow? I want you to know, oh, I really care about you a whole lot. That's all he's done in the two verses that he's spoken is asked for himself something. What a selfish man. How in the world could this be a man of God to ask something like this of this widow woman. Go get me some water was the first verse. Second verse is give me some bread that you have in your hand. Man, this guy's out of touch, wouldn't you think? Maybe with our society, but not with God. Listen closely. Let's take a look. Then she says in verse number 12, so she said, as the Lord your God lives. You didn't see the word your? You ought to circle the word your. Not her God, your God. You know why she said that? This is not a Christian woman. This is not a Jewish woman. This is a Gentile woman. This woman isn't even of the covenant. This woman doesn't have the same God, if you will, that, that uh, Elijah has. This woman is, a, is from a different tribe, Gentile. And she says these words, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in the bin and a little jar of oil and see, notice what she says, she goes on and she says, see that I gather uh, a, a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son. Now she's got a son involved. She's not only a poor widow woman, She's not only gathering sticks, she's not only making it very clear to the prophet of God, she doesn't have anything but a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. She's obviously gonna make a little bit of food 
And she says, it's for my son that we may eat it. And then the most amazing words, and die. That's how broke she is that she's going to eat her last meal with her son and they're going to die. Not live, die. I mean, you couldn't get further down the economic scale to get someone to help you than this woman. The lowest of the lowest economically is this woman. And yet God's going to use her to bring about a miracle. Now, I don't know if you've ever recognized or thought about it, but we've looked at widows three times now in five messages. Every one of them are poor widows. Every one of them have nothing. Every one of them don't have a thing. Let me tell you something about widows. God uses widows because if God could use someone who's at the bottom of the economic scale to bring forth a miracle, how much more can God use you? And if he knew a miracle in their lives, he can do a miracle my friends, in your life. Is that not true? So here she says something. She says, I'm going to prepare it for my son and I. Didn't think about preparing anything for you. And we're going to eat it and we're going to die. It's amazing. Verse number 13 comes along and says, and Elijah said, do not fear. In other words, can I say something? When God speaks to you about something, usually it's not something that's easy for you to understand. Usually it's not very practical. Usually it's not very easy to work with. Usually it's not very easy to consider. When God speaks to you something, man, the first thing he says to her, he says, do not fear. Because the first thing that happens when God says something weird to you is that you're going to start fearing. It's common, normal. I'm, I'm in fear. In other words, there's a risk to doing what God says. Do not fear. Go and do as I have said. Now watch this. This part's crazy. But make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards, make some of for yourself and your son... Wait a minute, he's, he, you gotta be kidding me. The first thing you got out of your mouth is give me water. The second thing is give me bread. The third thing is out, that you want me to make it to you and give it to you first? In our society here, for a nice person would say this, listen to this. Uh, can you imagine a pastor coming along and say, give it to me first and then you get the remains? Well, you'd go to some other church. And you know it. This guy is obviously, what we would normally say in our society is, listen, uh, I understand that. You're, you're, you're really down and out. Maybe I can do something to help you. I got a few coins in my pocket. Let me help you live a little longer. Uh, listen, go ahead and cook it up and you and your son eat. And You know, if there's anything left over, give it to me. You think I might be able to have some? That's what you would say. That's what I would say. He doesn't say this. Keep in mind, he represents God. And what happens in most of our life is we always have what's left over we give to God and not what's first. And when he makes this statement, give to me first, that's a mind blower for everybody. But until you put God first, you will never have the blessings in the future. Until God becomes first, you will always give God just the leftovers. And the way it's supposed to go is you give to God first, the leftovers are for you, God blesses the leftovers so that you prosper all the days of your life. And that's called a miracle. Verse number 14 comes along. And thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the bins of flowers should not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain upon the earth. You know how long that was? Three years. 
Three years, God performed a miracle all because of the next verse. Watch this, verse number 15. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. Wasn't the word of the Lord to her? Your God. Not my God, your God. But I believe the word of the man speaks. And she did according. In other words, she fed Elijah first. And then notice what it says. And she and he. Notice a little E and uh, H and the word he up here. And she and he. You know who the he is there? The he there is a prophet. He's moved in with her for three years. The guy's now going to live there and eat there, take up his being there until it rains. Remember, she was there, sent by God to provide. She didn't have anything, so God gave her the provision, but didn't give her the provision unless she was obedient to follow the things of God. And she and he in the household ate for many days. Verse number 16, watch this. Just pop it up. Verse number 16. And the bent of flour was not used up, nor the jar of oil ran dry according to the word of the Lord, which was spoken by Elijah. Now, what's the lesson? The lesson has got to be obedience. Oh, sure. The lesson has got to be giving to God first. Are you listening? Are you listening? That's a good lesson. But none of that's the lesson for today. The lesson is the heart of the widow. The heart of the widow, every one of them that we've seen, had a heart that said, I have nothing to lose. I'm at the lowest part of my life. I'm about ready to die. My kids are going to be taken from me. I have nothing. I'm going to eat and die. And when you have nothing to lose, there is no risk involved, and therefore there's no choice involved except to follow God. And may I say this to you, listen closely. With a widow being in the lowest economic scale, the reason that God could use them, each one of them, for us as examples is because we need to be people who realize that we have nothing to lose. Here's why. Because without God, you have nothing anyway. Listen to me. You can have a family, raise your kids, and your kids serve the devil, die and go to hell. And what good was it you having a family? Without God, you have no future. Without God, you have no job. Without God, you have no finances. Without God, you have no investment. Without God, you have no home. Without God, you have no marriage. Without God, you can't love your husband. Without God, you can't love your wife. Without God, your kids won't make it. Without God, your future is stymied. And we are like widows, at least we're supposed to be where nothing that we are allowed to maintain keeps us from not giving to God first. And as long as you have something to lose, there is a risk involved. And that's the difference. Because bottom line for all of us, my friends, listen to this. For all of us, we have nothing without God so if that's true, and you know it is, because he has it all. Listen, you can't even breathe without God providing the air. Everything you have, everything you say, everything you do, every place you'll go, everything you'll ever be is because of God. So what have you got to lose? We're like modern day widows. At least we're supposed to be. The problem with it is, is we're not. We're still holding on to our stuff that we have to lose. And as long as you hold on to the stuff that you have to lose, you will lose it. Because here's why. You will be challenged in your decision to serve God. Let me take you to Mark 10th chapter. Is that okay? Are you with me so far? Now listen, we're going to grow today. We're going to learn today. We're going to see it for ourselves today. Mark the 10th chapter. Here's a man that approaches Jesus. 
This man approaches Jesus in Mark the 10th chapter and you're going to see that he obviously had something to lose even though he really cared about God. Verse number 17, if you will, Mark the 10th chapter says it like this. And as he was coming out on the road, speaking of Jesus, one came running and he knelt down before him. Here's the position of the man before Jesus. What a humble position. Wow, what a cool guy, is he? Watch this. He knelt down before Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit the uh, eternal life? The whole thing was, Lord, what can I do to inherit eternal life? What is it you want me to do? What do you think I should do to inherit eternal life? Can I tell you something? That's a cry of every person in this building. Jesus comes along and he makes a statement. He automatically, from the words of his mouth, knew his heart instantaneously. He said, good teacher. First of all, he's more than a teacher, but he acknowledged him as a teacher. Secondly, he used the word good. He, he didn't know what good was. There's none good but God, the Bible says. So listen, we have our own ideologies and philosophies, our home, own human society evaluation of what's good. What's good is not what society says. What's good is what God says. And you will never determine what to do that's good in life until you get to the place where you realize that there's none good except what God says. We don't draw from the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. We draw from the heartbeat of God and what his word is eternal says to us. Are you listening to me? He says, but I want to know how to have eternal life. Jesus looks at him in verse number 18 and he makes this statement. And he says, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. Do you know the commandments? And the fact that it's not a question mark, it's really a, explain, a statement. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal. In other words, he knows that these works that this guy's going to be doing is not good enough. Do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And the guy says, wait a minute, I've done that. Next verse, since, 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 since I was a child. And then Jesus makes a statement, and what the statement he makes is really not about how good you are or whether you keep the law, because that won't get you to heaven. Listen to me right now. Religion won't get you to heaven. Good works don't get you to heaven. If good works could get you to heaven, then why did the Father send the Son? All he needed to do was send an angel over with a bunch of pamphlets and drop them all over the cities. And so Jesus makes this statement. He looks at him, and I love Jesus, and he loved him. Because you know something about God? He always looks in the depths of our hearts, know where we came from, know the problems and trials we've had in the past, knows the way that we are because of what we are, knows what we are because of the ways. No one else knows that. And he loves him and he says, one thing you lack, can I tell you something about God? If you never learn anything else, there's one thing you've got to understand about God. God knows more about you than you know about yourself. Is that not true? All of a sudden, you go to church, think you know everything. All of a sudden, God reveals something to you. Oh, my goodness, why did you even bring that up? <laughs> God knows more about you than you know about yourself. So Jesus is speaking to this guy. It wasn't about whether he was good works or not, because good works wasn't going to get him to what he wanted to have, and he was trying to explain that to him. And he makes this statement. He says, go your way and sell everything they have and give it to the poor, that you shall have treasure in heaven. Come. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, is Jesus saying to you to give everything away? No, but he's telling you a principle. The principle is that you've got to have an attitude with God that says, I have nothing to lose. Doesn't matter if you got it or not. Listen, you can keep it. God doesn't want it. God wants to add to it. God wants to bless you. God wants you to have that great house, wants you to have that car. He doesn't give a flip about any of that stuff. Doesn't matter at all. All he cares about is your heart and my heart, whether or not I have an attitude with him that says, man, I've got nothing to lose because everything I have comes from God. But well, listen to this. When I have stuff that I have that, that I have that I'm afraid to lose, then this verse comes in. Now, I mean, a lot of times you don't understand the adventure that was ahead of this man that he missed on. Did you know a lot of people wanted to follow Jesus? And Jesus wouldn't let him go. This guy is invited. Come on, pick up your cross, follow me. Can you imagine he could have been a disciple? He could have heard Jesus breathing at night. He could have with his own eyes seen the miracles. 
of life-changing experience. He could have walked with a king of glory, the only begotten son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He could have rubbed shoulders and been with him all the time and, and, and no one else had that advantage. Nobody else except the disciples themselves. All, nobody else. And here's one who's invited. But because he had something to lose, let me say it again, because he had something to lose. One more time, because he he had something to lose. He's going to make the wrong decision based on the risk that he would have in order to give it away. He makes the wrong decision. Now watch this. This is an amazing part of the whole thing. Next verse, verse 22 says this. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great possessions. I'm not telling you to give everything. I'm just telling you that your heartstrings can't be attached to what you have. And that everything you have, blessed be God if you have it, has got to be available for God if he calls for it. Because God will challenge your commitment along the road, just like this man, to see if your decision is real or is your heart attached to your wallet more than it's attached to things. Jesus goes on in Mark, the 10th chapter, talking about all the stuff that people go. You know, he uses the illustration. It's very difficult for a rich man to make it into the kingdom. He's using this because they haven't and are not willing to give up their heartstrings attached to their material wealth. Remember the illustration? It's more difficult for a rich man to go through the eye of a, of a, a needle than it is to get into heaven. The whole purpose of that. Then, then Peter speaks up. Peter, a lot of times people don't know about Peter. Let me talk to you about Peter. He was more than a disciple. This guy was rich. He had married into a family. If you go to Israel, you'll learn this. You'll see where his house was. You'll see where his business was. I walked on the walls of his house. I saw who it was. This man was rich. He was like the Bill Gates of his city. And he gave it all up to follow Jesus. That's what made him so incredibly special. The 10th chapter of Mark, verse number 28, follow me there if you will. Notice what Jesus says. And Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all. In other words, he's not afraid to make the statement. The statement is simply that we have nothing to lose. We have left all to follow you. And immediately Jesus says for people who have left all to follow him, in verse number 29, Assuredly, I say unto you, this is no one who has left house or has left his brothers or sisters or follower, father, mothers, wives, children, or lands for my sake and the gospel, who shall not receive, who shall not receive a hundredfold return. Listen to this. In this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and, and lands with persecution, and at this age to come, eternal life. But many who will be first will be last, and the last shall be first. I'll tell you what, the widow who had nothing but followed God and had nothing to lose will be first. It wasn't based on being first in this world. It's being first with God. And that's what he's talking about for every one of us that are in here. Today is our commitment Sunday. For the next three years, we're going to make an effort as a church, not from our wallets and not from our checkbooks, but from our hearts to the Lord. This is not about numbers. It's about your heart. But I'll tell you this right now. You're going to have to be somebody who responds correctly from your heart to God, not incorrectly, just getting by. Let me say this last word to you. You have nothing to lose. Are you following me? I want to talk to some of you. Today, before we go any further, you need to get right with God. You are right now the most important thing. God brought you here for a reason today. He heard you cry and he heard you say these words. I need to get 
back to God. And he heard you. And today God brought you in this place. One woman came up to me recently. She had tried to commit suicide three times. Came to church. God touched her heart. Today her whole family is saved. Serving the Lord. I don't know who you are in this place, but if you were to die, you were not right with God. Unfortunately, this is a harsh and hard word to say to you, but someone needs to love you enough and respect you enough and honor you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth that you're going to die and go to hell if you don't get right with God. And today, God's brought you here right now before we do anything else to get right with God. You've been running from him long enough. You've been looking the other directions, trying everything else, and it hasn't worked. And you know you need to give God all of your heart. And you know you need to give God all of your life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way but his way. And today, it's his way we're talking about. Jesus says in John 3rd chapter, you must be born again. That simply means this. Most people in American churches don't know what it means, but I'll, I'll tell you what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. You see, he gave you all of his heart. He gave you all of his life. And now he's asking you to give it back. I already know you know who Jesus is in your head. Most Americans call themselves Christians because they know who Jesus is in their head. They celebrate Christmas and Easter every year, and you have. You're not against God, but the problem with it is, is you're not wholehearted for God. Therefore, today, God's brought you here for a reason. Today, to get right with God. Before we go any further, to get back to God for some of you. For some of you, the first time to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Be born again, listen to this, and headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Nope, you're not going to go, but it's going to take something on your part. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches that we've watered that down. But I'm here to tell you the truth. Today is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? How do I give God all of my heart? How do I give God all of my life? Let's don't do it your way or my way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. You're going to have to do something on your behalf to get God to do something on your behalf. If you do nothing, he'll do nothing. If you do something, he'll do something. That's simply what it is. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up all over this auditorium, back in the family rooms, in the foyer by television, wherever you're at, your hand goes up and I'll see your hand go up and then you can put it right back down. How simple is that? I won't embarrass you, but even if you were embarrassed, isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Listen, you're not saying you want to get back to God because things are good. You want to get back to God so that you can know things are good. That's what this is all about. It's time for you to make the commitment of all of your heart and all of your life. And let's don't go another moment having a church service with some of you not right with God. Let's get right with God. Today, again, is your day of salvation. I already know you know who he is in your head, but you're going to have to raise your hand in a moment and put it right back down. It's that simple. Let me see it, put it down, hold on, we'll do it all at the same time, and then put it right back down. I'll count to three, who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure 
If you're saying to yourself, I don't know that I've really ever given him all of my heart, just look at your lifestyle. That'll tell you whether you've given him all of your heart. Today is your day. Come on. Come on. Come on home. Jesus is telling you, come on home. He loves you, and now it's your day. I'm counting to three. I've done my job for you. Don't sit there and stare at me. Do something about it by getting your hand up. Put it right back down. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Thank you. Seventeen. Thank you. Eighteen. Thank you. Nineteen. Thank you. Back on this far side. Thank you. On this side over here, 19, there's 20. Thank you. There's 21, 22, 23, 24 in a family room, 25, 26, 27, 28 back there, 29, about 30 right there. Thank you. Another person there. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Just wave your hand at me if that's you. Anybody else? Now, here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all gonna give you a hand for doing what you're doing by raising your hand. But if you're one of those 25 or 30 people that have raised their hands, I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to get your coach's purse, your friend if you need to bring a friend. If you're in the family rooms, listen to me family rooms, get a hold of your kids, it's okay, bring them. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. If you're in the foyer, tell an usher, they'll let you come down in front. Only takes a few moments. We want to pray with you. We want to invite Jesus. We're all going to remain standing as you do that. So we're excited about you coming. All of you that raised your hand, you're serious about God. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Bring a friend if you need to. Get your stuff and meet me right here in front. Listen to me. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. Oh, hear me. That's a bunch of you. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. Just get your stuff and get down here. Nothing's more important than you doing this right now and getting your heart right with God. Come on, you come home right now. Let's bring him home. Come on. Come, 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 come. Thank God, thank God, thank God you've come. Real quick, I want you all in the front. Listen to me, we just want to pray with you. Only takes a few moments, I'm going to let you come right back in the church service. Look over here to your left. See this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. Is that okay? Then we'll let you come right back into the church service. Only takes a few moments. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life 
to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.